Mother Nature is going to send all kinds of different disturbances to your doorstep and going to test your ability to um, offset those bad conditions that nature sends your way. Um, and you can't do that if you're just kind of guessing. Why is my plant uh, getting brown leaves or, you know, that it's got purple veins over here or it looks like somebody kind of put this leaf on a grill and all the edges are curled and brown. What does that mean? Exactly what do I have to do? Why is the biology in the soil not doing its job and fixing this problem? And sometimes it takes taking a sample, let's look at what's going on in the soil and you go, all the fungi are gone. Dr. Elaine R. Ingham is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Elaine has uncovered the soil food web nearly four decades ago and has been pioneering research about soil food web ever since. Widely recognized as the world's foremost soil biologist, she's passionate about empowering people to bring the soil in their communities back to life. Elaine's soil food web approach has been used to successfully restore the ecological functions of soils on more than 5 million acres of farmland all over the world. The courses that she offers are through the Soil Food Web School, have been designed specifically for people or for people with or without a science background, making them accessible to individuals who wish to learn to begin a meaningful and impactful career in the area that will help to secure the survival of humans and other species. She has many degrees and titles and has written thousands of different papers and publications, a BA in biology and chemistry from St. Olaf's College, an MS in microbiology at Texas A&M University, a PhD in microbiology at Colorado State, University, founder and president of the Soil Food Web Incorporated, obviously director and director of the Soil Food Web School. Elaine, thank you so much for being here. I could go on days with all your accolades because you've been doing this a few decades, four to be exact or more. Yep. Yeah, I think it's actually the 46th year this year. So wow. yeah, time keeps marching on. It, it sure does. And I'm so glad in your busy schedule, because even after 46 years, you're still going strong. I mean, you're, uh, I don't know if you look at it like, hey, I've still got another half of life to go and, and you're really not giving up. And yeah, that is my attitude. I, I have uh, decided that I'm going to live to 150. So if that's the case, I haven't even passed the halfway mark. Lots left to do, lots more things to investigate and figure out. Although I do notice kind of a, a little slowdown in the uh, speed at which I want to um, you know, world hop um, because yeah. it's a, it gets a little harder the older you, you get. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Let the youngins go out and explore the planet. <laughs> exactly. And I, I think that's probably a blessing that uh, has come about because of the pandemic, that it's um, more things have gone virtual. We don't have to travel as much. And uh, it's it's not about quantity. It's really about quality. And, and, and the work that you provide, I really see that time and time again. There was a, a fabulous uh, documentary, the S Symphony of Soil, about 130, 140 minutes long fabulous and uh, a testament yes you've been doing this a long time but also uh, um, uh, interesting to watch because it's uh, um, I don't know exactly the date on that but it's just you've it's about that quality and about really getting people aware of, of what's going on yeah I really enjoy that one symphony of the soil um, yeah. Deborah I think it's Coons. Yeah. Um, 
she was the director she put it all together and it was a lot of fun when she was here to film me to have conversations about where is this all going and what direction is is it going to take to to get there and boy we were wrong <laughs> the world uh, took this uh, sharp right turn uh when the virus came along and uh, really pushed everything to the virtual uh, setting where you know we couldn't leave our homes so how do you talk to everybody yeah so internet just i'm sure uh, the number of people using the internet just blossomed incredibly yeah, just, uh, yeah uh, zoom overtook um most most of the big companies in the world as billion dollar com company which we're on now for the recording uh, i want to kind of get into that um a little bit deeper, not just sim uh, the symphony of soil. I, I, most of your publications or writings, they're um, academic, they're uh, primers, they're handbooks, they're practical manuals as, well, as kind of what I see. And I've, I'm, I'm asking for you to prove me wrong. So you wrote for the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, the soil biology primer, which is the gold standard, triple gold standard, in my opinion, out there for farmers, USDA, they still promote it heavily on their website. And um, is that kind of the general attitude or general approach you've taken? Let's not get too academic, too scientific. Let's give people hands-on connective material so it's still science, it's still research, it's still important, but it's like, how can this be applied to your life as a gardener, as a farmer, as somebody who's producing food? Is that the general approach you've taken in most of your publications in writing? Um, I'd say that it's more like a 50-50 split, where I, when you write a paper for the scientific community, it's going to go into a scientific journal. And you have to follow that format and you've got to have a section on methodology and get down to the nitty and the gritty of what you used. So it's got to be, it's a whole different language almost. Yes, it's English, but it's this set of verbs, this set of nouns that you're going to use that would, if, a, if your average general person in the public picked up one of those journals, they'd be going, Oh my God, what, this is English, but I don't understand this, 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 you know, and they just throw it, you know, throw it down. And so we have to have a whole different set of publications that um, use simpler language. Um, you don't have to use how many microliters or, you know, megagrams or whatever, um, that you used you you don't have to you know say that it was pyrex glass that you used so for the general public it's go get a container and add uh, this much of your question material with this much of the the compost that you've made and look at how rapidly that um, uh, decomposes uh, you know whereas in the science we you know, it would take me a page and a half to explain exactly what we did and what tests we did. Whereas with the general public, it's more, um, you have to use your nose, you have to use your eyes, you've got to stick your hands into it, you've got to get a feeling for the structure in that material. And we're not necessarily going to be quantifying to the third decimal place, the way we have to in the scientific literature. So it's a it's the same information, it's just presented in a much easier to understand and using tools that the general public generally tends to have, eyes, nose, <laughs> mouth, you know. I, I always find it interesting when you go back in time that people will talk about, you know, uh, take a handful of your soil and take a bite out of it. Kind of chew it around a little bit. What do you taste? What are the flavors? As a microbiologist, I kind of go, ooh, what, would you, what could be in that? Um, so we're going to instead do the scientific studies on it. We're going to look at CO2. We're going to look at uh, what the biology is that we see using the microscope. Um, are you seeing the good guy bacteria or fungi or uh, 
uh, protozoa or nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, the presence of any one of those groups in a certain concentration tells you a lot about the history of what's been happening in that soil. Can we call it soil or we better ought to call it dirt? Because the only thing that's left there are the disease causing bacteria. Um, that's dirt. Um, Hansiani defined soil as being something that has to contain the textural material, sand, silk, clay, rocks, pebbles. It's got to have organic matter in it in order to feed the microorganisms. So you have to have the microorganisms. All the work in soil is done by the microorganisms. And if you go around killing them, then it's not soil. It's dirt. It's dirt. Yep. And that's Absolutely. what we've done to all of our agricultural lands. I remember when um, people, you know, the first uh, kind of go around with uh, where do we take all of this elevated CO2 in the atmosphere and where do we put it? And all of the soil scientists said, you can't put it into agricultural soils. Agricultural soils will not be part of the climate change carbon sequestration because you can't sequester carbon in agricultural soils. And I read that and went, what? I, are, are you nutsoid or something? Well, yes. Um, and certainly we've had a whole new generation of soil scientists that have succeeded that way, that group of soil scientists that just were so blinded to the fact that it's not that that can't become good soil once again, but right now it's dirt because you're tilling too much. You're slicing and dicing and crushing all of those organisms, except for the bacteria. And so what are you growing when you just basically have bacteria in the soil? Well, you're setting the stage to grow weeds. That's what mother nature does at that stage of succession. When you have just bacteria, it's going to be growing weeds. Well, that's not something we're going to eat, um, you know, because it's even before the dandelion stage of the soil. It's, you know, things you're not putting in your mouth because they're probably toxic to you. So how do we get off of that stage? Well, OK, if you're out there and the biology in the soil says you're going to grow weeds because the only form of nitrogen is nitrate. That also means that we're going to be going out there with herbicides. What do herbicides do to the whatever biology might be left in that soil? What do those herbicides do? They kill any organism that's still present in the soil. Say even say goodbye to your bacteria. There is nothing in that dirt to start fixing the problem. And we went down that pathway, you know, and it's like go back to why we started going down that pathway, it's because the motorized tractor came into existence in Australia in the late-ish 1800s, 1870, somewhere right around in there. And it got imported to the United States sometime in the, you know, in the early 1900s, 1905, 1902, depends on whose tractor you follow. Um, and OK, so, so you can go from only being able to till half an acre of your property on a daily basis to being able to uh, till 100 acres on a daily basis. So farmers were just over the moon on this one, except they didn't understand what they were doing to their soil. They were destroying soil. And so if that's yeah, your that attitude ball effect really as well. Yeah. Yep, because, uh, you know, it just spread across the large acreage farms. You go to a farm in Vermont and it's like, yeah, OK, 40 acres is big. So it doesn't really apply to those places because they're still tilling with little, you know, uh, small uh, versions of the um, tillage equipment or they're still tilling by by basically hand. Um, even in the southeast, it's still mostly small holdings until you get to the giant cotton plantations and things like that. So um, that's what started this whole downward um, situation with our soils. Because as soon as you start tilling, 
what you're going to be growing are weeds. Well, how do you get rid of weeds? Well, you're going to be applying these toxic chemicals that destroys everything in the soil. And so all of the benefits that your plants used to get from these organisms isn't going to happen anymore. You aren't going to be cycling nutrients in a nat natural way. Um, and most soil scientists, they just say, you can't possibly grow this much food without um, putting on this inorganic fer fertilizer or using these pesticides because your crops get sick. Uh, they're being attacked by a whole bunch of different things. You've got to be keep um, applying these toxic chemicals and you start going even further and faster down that hill to, uh, yeah, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So yeah, it we've been- It absolutely is. You're already taking us down some rabbit holes pretty early. So before we get too deep, I want I, because you brought it up, is, is there a way once we've hit the certification, once those clay sheets have dropped upon each other and there's no more water there and it's just thick, hard clay, to bring that back to life, to bring that dirt, basically that hardened clay back to something that is uh, living and, and a good soil? Or is that, a, is that like a, a pretty big task, you know, con bringing concrete back into something that's useful for agriculture? Yeah, it's, um, we always go out and do a site assessment first to be able to kind of give the grower an idea of how long this is gonna take in reality. Um, and especially where there may be, can't, they just can't let, let go of that last little bit of fertilizer. You, you, you know, I wanna use, well, at least drop your fertilizer use by 50% um, in that first year, but you're not gonna get all the way. Okay, so how about people who say full on? We can, in the course of about three months, completely turn that dirt back into soil but you have to be doing some very specific things you have to get hold of what's basically decomposed organic material a compost but it has to be made properly it has to stay aerobic at all times if you walk up to your compost pile or your big huge windrow and you a little downwind and it's like well where did that ammonia smell come from or whoa stinky smelly rotten eggs how <laughs> mix ammonia with a little stinky rotten egg smell and what do you call that it's just it's just bad with the anaerobic uh organic acids that are produced only under anaerobic conditions and you get those combinations of organic acids you know butyric acid uh, um, uh, spoiled milk or butter, some, that's that smell, um, uh, really high levels of lactic acid or, well, any number. And there's a list of about 150 different smells you want to be aware of so that if you smell them, you do the necessary work to get oxygen back into that whole compost pile. Um, so it's, it's not the waste reduction that has been pushed by the um, waste industry. When you collect everybody's garbage, what do you do with this stuff? Oh, we're going to compost it. That's not composting. You can smell those waste piles for you know five miles downwind. Um, and people who live near one of those uh, landfills, their nasal passageways just get used to that smell. It's normal. Um, the rest of us would not be able to spend the night there usually because the anaerobic conditions are releasing such nauseous um, materials. So you have to learn a whole new day, way of composting. And so we go through that process with people. Um, it only takes, you know, probably a two week period of time for people to really start to figure out and start to be able to make their own small compost piles or do their windrows um, and make large scale compost. Um, people who can't obey instructions usually can never make good compost. And we have um, a, a minimum value that you have to be able to have 
135 micrograms of fungal biomass, 135 micrograms of bacterial biomass. You have to have um, over uh, 10,000 protozoa and you've got to have at least 100 beneficial nematodes, no root feeders, thank you, not allowed. Um, so we've, we've even gotten so far as to put, here's the level that you have to have or don't bother or it, don't expect the, the outcome to be what you want it to be. If you can't, right here in the springtime, if you can't get it right, then you're not going to achieve what we're talking about. And so getting people to do that, it can be very difficult. So we basically have decided that we have to go out and we've got to make that compost for the world um, so that they're getting the real deal. They will be getting something where they can actually have normal nutrient cycling going on, where you will not lose any nutrient from erosion or leaching because it will all be held by the microorganisms and the structure that they're building in that in your soil. Um, as you know, you put the biology back in using the compost. We got to make sure that things are working all okay. That's where the microscope comes in, where you've got to be monitoring. If you don't want to monitor, well, then it could well take you four or five years before you get to the point where you're at least have a decent food web. Um, so we really want people to be capable of using a microscope. It's not that hard. It's we can teach third graders how to use uh, uh, the microscope that we need to be able to see all these organisms in the soil. We had a booth at, um, at, at a meeting that was for citizen scientists. And people would come by our booth and look through the microscope and start playing with it. And we'd work with them. And they would get it figured out in the course of 20 minutes. They were using the microscope all by themselves. And then it becomes, look, 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 look at this. What is this? And we're, we're on a TV camera and we'd be able to talk through, well, this is a nematode. How do you tell if it's a good guy or a bad guy? Well, look at these big lips up here. That's a bacterial feeder. Good, you know, that's, yay, you've got those bacteria. Something's going to be in control of those bacteria. And then going along and finding a microarthropod or finding a protozoan or a flagellate or a ciliate and being able to tell them, oh, ciliates, those, you, you really, that's not a good sign. That is, uh-oh, what was this sample? Because we need to tell those folks that um, their soil is anaerobic. It has too many anaerobic sites in it, and we're seeing that effect. So yeah, affiliates consume, you know, some, I've heard you say before about 10,000 bacteria a day, you know, yep. so um, there you, you've already taken us way deep right at the beginning. So I, I, I want to get into that definitely. And um, I want to let my listeners know that you and I don't know if you still are, but you were with the Rodell Institute for a while as a chief soil scientist. Is that basically correct? Yep. Yeah, they're chief scientist. And of course, chief since I'm scientist. a soils person, it really interprets it into that. Yeah. yeah, I was at the Rodale Institute for about three years. Yeah, that and that's amazing. So I, I'm doing a book with a bunch of other collaborators called Menu B and Maria Rodale, her grandfather and her father, you know, has started the Rodale Institute and and uh, she she wrote a real nice section, and I'm hoping to steal a section from from you as well for the book on on soils. Um, but but not only have you been doing this, but there's science at regenerative farming, at organic farming, at places like the Rodale Institute is probably one of the pinnacle places uh, institutes related to agriculture and farming and no-till methods and soil health. They were in Kiss the Ground and that. And, and so that leads me kind of to what I, I've tickled about in the past, but I want to ask you, so you already brought in the aspect of the microscope, but is farming and gardening a science? Is it kind of mixed yeah. in there with that as well um I, because i say so it's not you know when you hear people say farming gardening it's just natural it's back to the roots well i actually tend to think it's a science and so my question is is gardening and farming a science 
especially if you want to always have good results because mother nature is going to send all kinds of different disturbances to your doorstep and going to test your ability to um, offset those bad conditions that nature sends your way um, and you can't do that if you're just kind of guessing why is my plant uh, getting brown leaves or you know that it's got purple veins over here or it looks like somebody kind of put this leaf on a grill and all the edges are curled and brown what does that mean exactly what do i have to do why is the biology in the soil not doing its job in fixing this problem and sometimes it takes taking a sample let's look at what's going on in the soil and you go all the fungi are gone absolutely they're just gone uh most of the protozoa most of the nema you know and so now what do we do we go get our compost that contains all of the diversity of those organisms in that vicinity and you want it to be local indigenous organisms you don't want to be buying your compost from california if you live in illinois because when you take those California microorganisms that are used to dry, arid, desert-like conditions, and you put them into Illinois, where does it ever stop raining in Illinois? You've got, you know, thunderstorms throughout the summer. And here these poor little desert-adapted microorganisms are going, I'm drowning, and they just go to sleep or they die you've got to get the local guys because mother nature has been working for the last four billion years to adapt those bacteria she's been working on the fungi for the last 3.5 billion years to make certain all that diversity is there and all the predators everything you need is present in that soil so we it's a science absolutely if you want to have good crops all the time you've got to take that scientific approach. If you really don't care, you know, it's like my garden outside. I put things industriously, put in all kinds of things and I'm gonna have a bumper crop of this, that or the other. And then I'm called off to Australia for three weeks. And I come back and my, my garden, the deer have come in and eaten everything. Uh, and if it wasn't the deer, then it was the bunnies. If it wasn't the bunnies, it was the turkeys. And if it wasn't, so you have to be there to understand what's going on in your in your garden um, and fix it. Love it. I absolutely love it. And so you've already kind of answered this question as well uh, when you mentioned the microscope. So it is a recommendation. Go out there and, and get a microscope. Not only is it a fun uh, if you have kids or grandkids, but it's also fun if you want to do it right to see the living organisms, the living soil, what's in there, what's going on to get a test. And when you spoke earlier about composting, it's not just about compost, it's also about this um, active tea compost. So it's your, your um, liquid, compost. yeah, liquid uh, compost tea in that. And, and you really, you also have a, a nice kind of a, a, a field guide or um, a, a book on the tea composting and do a bunch of things there. One of them is interesting is, uh, um, and I don't know how strong the affiliation is on this sim soil um, and, and, and things which is related to me is this symbiotic relationship, which, which we see in the soils. And so um, definitely, if I understand you correctly, we should, uh, get a little bit of wisdom, have some fun, get a microscope and, and, and look and see what we're doing. But we should also not just go out and buy a mo microscope uh, without kind of knowing what we're looking for and what we're doing. And that's with what the courses you teach and how you're educating people. Yep. The foundation classes, the foundation courses, um, there's four of them. And the first one we go through an explanation of all the seven over, overarching principles of how the biology in the soil benefits plant growth. And so we go through uh, nutrient cycling, retention of nutrients in the soil, um, getting rid of diseases and pests, because of course, if your plant is getting all the nutrition it needs every second, 
of every day, it's getting the balance of all the nutrients it requires, then that plant's immune system is going to work. And here's where, you know, it's like soil chemists, they were out there doing all these terrible things to the biology in the soil, killing them all. And then they would put plant their plants and they go, plants don't have immune systems. Well, they would if you put the system back the way it's supposed to be. Of course, if you don't have any of the support cast present, that plant can't possibly invoke its immune system. It doesn't have the nutrients it needs to have that immune system. You start getting the nutrients into the plant every second of every day, it's got an immune system. There ain't no way root feed nematodes are going to be messing with that plant. No way. Disease causing organisms, um, wilts and blights and all those fungal and bacterial diseases and insect pests that are attracted to your plant when it doesn't have the right balance of nutrients. So get that biology back in the soil, get all these benefits. Let's build some soil structure so the root systems of your plants can grow as deep as they possibly need to grow. So how far down, you know, take one of your, you know, your favorite, like corn. Um, how far down do the root systems of corn go? Go out to any chemical agricultural field and here's the top of the soil. And you look about three inches down and that's all the further your plant's roots go down because it's so compacted here that the roots can't push their way into that. Well, it ain't, it's not, it's not soil, it's dirt. And so the roots go sideways, which means this plant, uh, this corn plant is fighting with that corn plant and that corn plant and that one over there and this one over there. They're all fighting for the same limited set of nutrients. So none of them can be healthy. I don't care if you've got mycorrhizal fungi on there or not. They can't possibly be healthy because they're not getting all the nutrients that they need from that little itty bitty bit of, well, and what's the percent organic matter in that? Less than half a percent? There's no nutrients in there for the plants to find. As soon as we can get the biology back and rebuild the structure of that compacted soil, and it takes them about you know, four to five days to get through an inch, maybe two of that compacted soil. So it, it's going to take a time. So let's get going on this in the fall. So all through the winter time, these microorganisms are happily chewing away and building structure, structure for you. As long as there's a layer of snow or you've got a layer of leaves on top of them, they're gonna, there's going to be free water and they're going to be doing their job all winter long. Come springtime, they just speed up. So how far down can the root system of a corn plant go? 15 to 25 feet. Wow, amazing. You don't have to worry about nutrition because when you have that much, you know, and, and the corn plant doesn't put its uh, roots out sideways, it puts its roots downwards because that's where the summer water is going to be. As that snow melts and percolates down, infiltrates, it's going to be held in small pores. So you better have 10 feet of soil for that root system to get to enough water and people always say well but I, I've got a layer of rocks at eight feet yeah so who cares right down to that eight feet and and hope that the mycorrhiza takes care of that rock for you yep or you'll find that yeah you've got a layer of rock where you know geologically speaking some event happened and it laid down sand and now it's sandstone or whatever, but you go through the cracks and the crevices in that rock and you get to the other side and there's another layer of soil. And then there's another layer of soil and another, you know, going down much, much deeper. So your root system can get down to 25 feet if it needs to. If it doesn't need to, if the soil's really good and that top 10 feet will supply all of the nutrients all of the water that your plant requires, then it doesn't put its roots down any deeper. So how healthy is your soil? How much nutrient cycling is going on and getting incorporated? Well, measure the depth of your root system. 
if it's only going four feet and that's a healthy plant, you've got excellent um, nutrient concentrations, excellent organic matter. You know, you, you have to have a soil that has an organic matter concentration of at least 3%. And you're going to have to work on it. If you don't have that level right now, you take the rest of this growing season and get it up to above 3%. I'm always just astonished at chemicals, um, soil chemical labs, where you send a sample in, they send it back, and it's here's the organic matter layer. And it says that your organic matter layer should be between 3% uh, and 5%. Like as if you get higher than 5%, it's something bad, something's wrong. And they'll actually say that if, you know, if it comes back with your organic matter levels, say like 8%, they'll tell you that your organic matter level is too high and you have to do something to get rid of it. You're destroying water holding capacity if you don't have that organic matter. If you're doing something to destroy it, you're destroying the fertility of the soil. Oh, but who are the businesses that that soil chemistry lab is directly related to, that they get their money from? Santo, oh. Bayer, DuPont, probably, all those. Bingo, cities. you got it, yeah. You yeah. Know? And so whose health are they taking care of? Not yours. Yeah. So we got to get that message across to people is there is absolutely no reason to put inorganic fertilizer on their soil and it's actually detrimental. They're gonna go backwards instead of forwards. I've seen some of um, your, your images, but also many others who've actually been down in, in the trenches. They've been out on the farm and they've dug the trenches and they've gone down six, 10, 12 more feet to look at the soil from that level. Nicole Masters, uh, Gabe Brown, um, uh, Ma Richard Perkins, many others have, have, have as well. You and, and before I go, because I want to go deeper exactly on what you said there as well. I want to just touch that you do have this soil summit, and it is just it just completed here not too long ago. Um, Dr. Vandana Shiva, Dr. David Montgomery was there and, and a speaker, you know, geologist, co-founder of Dig to Grow. Nicole Masters was there, Darren Doherty, uh, John Kempf, you know, uh, uh, I can't, I can't ever remember if he's a Mennonite or Amish, but he's just the most educated, well, young man and super guy ever on on uh, knowledge and make sure that he speaks to the right people. Christina Young, John D. Liu, who basically was there filming the restoration in, in China and the, the plateaus of China. Um, and that it is possible to take dead and dying, decertified soils and, and bring it around. Uh, Peter McCoy, and I could go on and on. You had tons and tons of fabulous people just it was a plethora one after the other at the summit and of course you, you were speaking as well given your soil food web course but there was something that you you just said i want to dive in deeper but first i need to ask you if you can give me a story so a lot of the novices or those who don't know a lot about composting or it's only what we've seen in films and, and things I won't, um, usually they know enough that your compost pile needs to be done and structured in a, in a certain way and that it needs to get the temperature up. But most people don't know why the temperature gets so high. And you have a beautiful way of explaining that and telling that that when you do it, I think the light bulb goes on for a lot of people. I don't, I, if you could just, Tell us that, why it does that and how it does that. I would so appreciate it because I think people would just really love to hear that. One of the first things you have to realize when you're dealing with organic matter is that it's probably going to have some diseases on it. It's going to have disease causing organisms. Maybe they're not actually causing the disease right now. They're hanging out but we can't let them go through to somebody who's gonna put that on 
their garden uh, you know, or in the, on the pastures or in the fields, we can't let those disease causing organisms get promulgated. So here we're dealing with this organic matter. We know there's some uh, diseases on it and the way to get rid of them is to heat your compost up. It's almost like autoclaving except that it's, you know, so we're not gonna go under the deep pressure that you do in an autoclave because most people don't wanna deal with something like that. Um, and you would kill the good guys along with the bad guys. So how do you get the product that you want of all the good guys pretty much make it through and all of the bad guys are wiped out? Well, you gotta bring the temperature up. You have to get the temperature above 131 degrees Fahrenheit for a full 72 hours, three days. You can't turn until that hot center has killed all of the disease causing organisms, all the E. coli, all the salmonella, all the shigella, all the pasturella, all of those disease nasties, the fungal diseases, verticillium, and uh, on and on and on. So we know that that center of the pile is now in a good place. We don't have to worry about the disease causing organisms. So we're gonna turn the pile and we turn the pile such that uh, what was in the middle is now gonna be on the bottom and the top goes to the, yeah. So but you've, you gotta go through the diagrams to understand all of that. But why is it that as the temperature of the compost pile started at ambient temperature, and uh, started to climb almost right away because we put party food into that compost pile to get all of the cameras um, bringing in all these microorganisms and you uh, have enough party food for them to get going and having a wild dance and they're having the perfectly wonderful time in there. And of course, when you're at a party, what happens? You end up in bed with somebody else. And so as these microorganisms go through the process of reproduction, think about yourself as you're going through reproductive practices. Does your temperature get higher and higher and higher? Yeah, you, you know, pretty soon you're sweating, nice, hot, you know, so great. Same thing happens in the compost pile with the microorganisms. As they reproduce, they are releasing heat. And that's what starts to elevate the temperature in your pile. Well, you want it to get above 131, but you don't want it to be anywhere close to 180. So there's the range of temperatures we can work with. If you're only in the 130 to 145 range, you're going to have to keep the um, compost together, uh, not turn it for three full days. Well, if the temperature went above 145 to maybe 160, you would only have to have the temperature above that level, those levels for two days. If you get above 160, 165, you only have to have that temperature for two days or excuse me, 24 hours. So it, you know, how fast do you want to get your compost finished? If you don't really want to worry about it too much, you just maintain things between 131 and 145. If you want to zoom, 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 get along, uh, but then see how close you're, be, you're getting to that 180 mark. And if you go anaerobic at all, if that, if those organisms reproducing and having a good time at the party are getting the temperature up too high, as it gets too, too much activity in there, they use up all the oxygen. And now you go anaerobic and the anaerobic organisms um, take all of the oxygen away. There's not enough oxygen for the good guys. So they go to sleep. The bad guys start making alcohol. And when that alcohol hits a temperature of 180 degrees, it will burst into flames. Combustion will happen, which is why a lot of people don't like to make compost if they don't know what they're doing because they don't realize that it goes anaerobic at a certain point, there's too much activity and kaboom, everything bursts into flames. I, I remember a project in, um, in Utah where they called me up like two weeks after everything had happened. And they said, you know, uh, we were making a compost pile 
And um, we thought it was coming along just fine, you know, and all of a sudden it burst into flames and it burst into flames so dramatically that it broke windows in everybody's houses and barns and cars and all of that for like a two mile radius. So you do not want to you, you want to know what you're doing. You've got to have an idea of where the danger zones are. So we're going to turn the pile. When you get have been hot enough, long enough, get all that oxygen back in, fluff everything up, get it all turned. So the next contingent of your pile that hasn't gotten up to um, temperature is now in the middle and it will um, increase and hang out for a couple of days. Now it's been hot enough, long enough, you're going to turn it. So the last section of your compost pile is going to come into that middle area. And it doesn't matter if you're using a you know, cage, wire cage to make your compost in, or if you're doing windrows. The pattern is the same. You take the hot middle and move it to the top. What was on the top is moved to the sides. What was in the sides is now in the middle. So you just, you know, every time you turn, you do that. And what we find is that we only have to turn two times because we're being so careful about where the organisms have been and that they all get up to that temperature that we're going to kill the bad guys and the good guys will prevail. So now you let that compost pile come down to ambient and ta-da, there you are. You've got a massive diversity of all of the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, and you can use that as an inoculum for any part of your farm. What we've actually seen is that if you take that compost and you, turn, you extract the organisms off the surface of that compost, and all the soluble nutrients come with as well, all those humic acids, fulvic acids, oleic acids that are in that compost, all of those are soluble and they move into the liquid. Well, you can take the bag with your compost solids in it, let it drip dry a little bit, just put those solids back onto your windrow or your, your uh, compost pile. And um, now you can apply the liquid that has all of the organisms and a whole bunch of food in it as well. And so you spray that out on your property and that is uh, just as good as uh, the, comp the solid compost. The only difference being that you're not putting organic matter out. If your soil is still down at you know, 0.5 or one or two or three, you really want to put the compost out as well. So, you know, you can see where you have a change in management. You've got to know what your organic matter level is in that soil. And, and a real good way of doing that is to stick your hand in the soil. If you stick your hand in your soil and you bash your fingers into a compacted part of the soil, yeah, it, you know, there's, you don't have any organic matter in your soil. You know, go get the biology and get it out. But if you put your hand in and you can actually pick up a handful, you can shake it a little bit. See if you've got any airways and passageways to allow oxygen, water, roots to go into that soil. Um, so there's one piece of information you really want to know. And the other thing you want to know is what does it smell like? And it should smell like a good, rich forest soil. If you have a high enough concentration of organic matter, that's exactly what it will smell like. And that's the goal that you're trying to get to. I want my soils to be at least 50% organic matter. And then I don't ever have to worry about compaction. I don't have to worry about the disease causing organisms. That's been solved. And it, um, I don't have to worry about weeds either. Yeah, exactly. There's, I mean, uh, I, I've even seen people take their um, compost tea and and put it into the ground. So not just spray it, they actually like almost inoculate, push it down and then inject, you know, inject little shots along the way. Um, I don't know how effective that is, but I've seen a lot of different processes. One thing that was interesting as well is in this reproductive party where they're generating heat, just like we do. Uh, when, when we're excited in the bedroom. Um, the question is, 
is that because the cells are dividing and splitting as well along along the way and that's releasing energy it's this exponential growth basically inside your compost pile yeah because that's what we really mean when we're talking about reproduction with the bacteria we had one bacterium now you've got two two become four four becomes 16 16 becomes 80 whatever and so within and and reproduction occurs, or it can occur, every 20 minutes when you're working with bacteria. So there's another elevation in temperature, another one, another one every 20 minutes. And you can imagine that as you go from one bacterium to a million bacteria in 24 hours, that's a lot of heat that's going to be released. And I know we've got the data that says, here's how much heat that is, re, is produced with every reproduction event that goes on. And by the time you go from one bacterium to a million, and you've got that many, you've got 10 to the sixth power bacteria in that, um, in, your, in your organic matter and, and uh, can, yeah, in your organic matter uh, in the compost pile. Uh, you can multiply that and yeah, your your temperature is going to be going zoop. You, we maybe don't want it to be that fast. So you might take some of the more, you might put in more of the, of the greens and the woodies, less party food. So you control the temperature. Is it going to kind of slowly approach turning time or is it going to go whoop? And, and I have had compost piles that we over, um, we put too much party food in. We underestimated how much nitrogen was really in that manure or in those legume materials or whatever, you know, spent um, um, beer waste or something, real good source of, of party food. Uh, and so I, I, we've had temperatures that we started the pile at like nine o'clock in the morning and by noon, it was already at 150 degrees. And you know you're going to have kaboom time happen about 9 o'clock in the evening if you don't slow things down. And so you got to come in with a, um, a bunch of newspaper that's shredded or cardboard or other wood chips, something that will um, take away the, the concentration of the high level nitrogen. And then and you see the, the, the pile levels off quite nicely. We like to, when we, when we teach people how to do, make compost, that's the foundation course number two. Um, we give them all of this kind of information. We have them uh, make three compost piles and that it has to be sequentially because you're gonna learn a whole bunch of information from your first compost pile. So now you apply it to your second compost pile and everything comes out real close to perfect. And you've still learned a whole bunch more. And now you make your third pile. And usually people get, you know, grade A compost. This was wonderful stuff. It only takes that long. And we, when we compost, the compost, when, when you really follow everything like we do, and we turn right on time and we make certain that you've got the right mixes, um, it only takes 21 days to go from starting compost to finished where the temperature has started ambient, taken off and it's done its turns and you've done turning. So the pile comes right back to ambient within 21 days. Um, so, you know, it takes something a little bit more than half a month to make a, a compost from finish to end when you know what you're doing. Microscope, very we, we could We could go, uh, I mean, you've, you, down 10 different rabbit holes, but thank you so much for elaborating and giving us that glimpse on not only what your courses offer, how in depth, but also the, the wood wide web, the soil web, the, that, that is right below us, all around us. There, there is a saying that human health, our health, your health, my health is a microcosmos of 
the the area that around us or the area where we live and um there's this this uh, uh microbiome that the microbiome of our bodies is very close to the microbiome of our soils and our health of that microcosmos around us and um is that absolutely true that that those two microbiomes us having crawled out of that primordial soup how many millions of years ago um, is very similarly tied to the way our health goes in, in our soils and our food. We're very dependent on the sets of microorganisms uh, in your digestive system all the way through. And, you know, people always seem to talk about it like it was one single thing. No, there's a food web that goes on in your duodenum um in in your stomach that's different from what happens at the top of your small intestine um as you go through parts of your small intestine there are different communities that are very dependent on all the rest of these communities doing their thing properly and then you get into the large intestine a whole bunch of different communities as you go along most people think of our waste material as it develops going through the intestines is completely anaerobic no way um, the stuff coming in the front end is aerobic and much of that escapes the acid in your diet in your stomach and moves into the small intestine while it's still fully aerobic and that's why you want to have very small aggregates you want to chew your food really well so it's all these micro aggregates where a lot of these aerobic organisms are going to make it through into the rest of your um, digestive system. As you go closer and closer to the exit um, of the, uh, the large intestine, you get more and more oxygen seeping back in through your anus. Wonderful thought. Um, so we have only begun to understand, well, it's a lot like soil. We have only begun to understand this system and how it works together. Every place you go, you're inoculating organisms. Anything you touch, you've just picked some of those microorganisms up from that surface. The, you know, we always used to think of uh, door handles as being one of the most dangerous things that you encounter in your daily um, work because that's all just chock full of all these other disease causing organisms that other people have spread and put there. No, it's aerobic. And that means the disease causing organisms are not going to be winning in any competition. Well, but what if you go and you take um, your um, antibiotic laced cleaning material and wash your door handle there's nobody there there's nobody left to protect you the next person that touches that door is going to leave behind you know maybe they just you know and now they're going to open that door <laughs> so the only thing you're getting at that point are the disease causing organisms and there's nothing there to compete with them i want a well-used doorknob because then the beneficial organisms are winning in that competition. Uh, I think a lot of people don't really grasp the, the notion. We, we've been on this antibacterial war uh, for, for a while, but they're in, in this uh, soil food web and in the way our soils work, uh, the pests, the bacteria, the those things, they're all part of the success of, of a healthy biome, of healthy soils, and things and uh, it's probably been now 15 minutes since you since you mentioned it but it's really triggered and it ties into the the the, the question that you answered on the biome which uh, i i really want to connect people to the earth to the soil i want them to know that the the distance from our own biome and our bodies and our guts is not that far and it's close related to the health of our soils and how we eat and what we eat and that we and we weren't dropped off on some planet germany or, or spaceship germany or spaceship america we we crawled out of this this primordial soup out of mother earth and, and um we're the basic elements of life are tied to that as well the the thing that you mentioned before though and, and this is where i want to bring it up now as you you said 
don't get your soils or your compost or those inputs for your farm or your garden from thousands of miles away from some desert area or from, from, from because that IMO, which stands for indigenous microorganism, is not going to be compatible to that nature environment, that tropical, with subtropical, tropical, or whatever the, the area where you're inputting that is. And so there's this thing that nat natural Korean farming and, and I IMOs, which stands for indigenous microorganisms, how do we ensure that that compost, that mixture, those organisms that we're putting into our soils, that they're that they're native, that they're ready for that that environment. Is there some tricks and tips that you can give us to to help with that understanding and to, to you're, thrive? You're really them? you're looking at your um, what do they call them? It's it's uh, the biological contingent that is dependent on uh, the typical kind of plant community present there, uh, the, the normal spread in degree days uh, at, you know, zero degrees or 35 or um, 100 or 110. It's the extremes that are probably the most important. Um, those organisms survive that bioregion. That's the word I was looking for. You want to be pulling everything out of the same bioregion. Um, and of course, as you get to the extremes, are you really still in your bioregion or are you in the next one over? Well, close enough. You probably want those edge critters as long as you've got things that are being uh, pull, getting pulled out of the center of that climate zone. Um, so, you know, like the Great Plains of the United States, uh, all of that is the same biome. Uh, because the temperatures are pretty much the same, the winter winds are, the snow amounts. So when you get into the mountains where it starts to change a little bit, well, you know, we could probably still get by with a handful or two of, of um, soil from the middle of that, from the um, Arches National Park or go into Moab. Um, the thing you want to be careful about is when you're collecting your inoculum for a compost pile that will be from that bioregion is that you want to take just pinches, you know, a quarter of a teaspoon. You don't need any more. I run into people out, you know, collecting to start their compost pile with, and they they're digging up a 55 gallon drum of material, and it's just like put that back in the soil now or I'm going to go call the park rangers on you because you don't need that much. You just need a teaspoon, quarter teaspoon will do. So, you know, put, put those mixes together and shake those up and inoculate your compost pile with it. But then once your compost pile has been uh, inoculated with those organisms, you've got those organisms. You don't have to go out collecting anymore. Uh, or maybe you just go out and collect in, in, in more, interesting places, harder to get to the top of the mountain and underneath the waterfalls or whatever. Um, Isn't that similar to like some making sourdough bread? People keep that, uh, that the yeast or that organism continually thriving and alive as long as that, then, then that lasts you forever, right? Yep. Yep. It's just that, you know, like compost is easier to take care of because, you know, so you get a few nasty things that get into the middle of your pile. Well, you're going to make compost with most of that. And now you've got the conditions where you can delete the bad and only end up with the good. So we want all of the different groups of the, or, or, uh, the um, food web present in there. So, you know, making the liquid forms of the compost, we, I, we talked about that briefly with compost extract, where you just massage and you get the organisms off the surface. If you want to grow those organisms so that you can apply that compost tea to the above ground foliage, those organisms have to be active. They have to be growing in order to make the glue that the instant they fall on that leaf surface, they're going to stick. Otherwise, you know, they just go next time it rains, it, it's all down there in the soil. That's not where we need it. We need it up on the on the, uh, the plant surfaces. 
So get those organisms growing in the tea and you're only going to be able to get a certain percentage growing because of the temperature and the moisture, et cetera, that you're at, uh, what kinds of foods in the, that compost tea, but spray all of your foliage, all of the above ground parts of your plants. And that helps with the immune system. It works right in to that immune system that the plants are producing. And then the foundation course number four is the microscope. That's where we train you to do um, the qualitative assessments. If you want to get all quantitative and get all get all the way to the third decimal place, you know, really um, finely tuned, that's the CLP course where we teach people how to become a laboratory technician. Open your own lab. Um, everybody in your town should bring you their samples and think of the fun you can have talking with all your uh, the, the people in town about what they uh, what's in their soil and what does that we what does that mean um, so we'd uh, like people to come back also and take the counts con uh, consultant training because we get into very specific um, case studies and go through what does it mean when you see that what does it mean when it's you see this what ha what does it mean when both your bacteria and your fungi are sky high or you know this or this or yeah, you got problem with weeds, we can deal with that because weeds, true weeds require nitrate and only nitrate as their force, uh, source of nitrogen. If we can get the fungi growing at all and start getting some NH4 ammonium into that soil solution, most weeds will not germinate and they will not grow. So that's well, that's the easy way to deal with weeds instead of, you know, most organic growers have been told the only way that they can get rid of weeds eventually is to till them out enough times and then they finally won't come back. There's some farms that, I, you know, I've been working with them for the last 35 years and uh, their neighbors following that approach still haven't gotten rid of their weeds, whereas the farm we're working on, the, the weeds are gone, not a factor. So getting that switch from strictly bacterial into getting more and more and more fungal to what your plant, what your crop requires. Yep. And we want to make certain that people understand the role and function of mycorrhizal fungi because you know, plants like the brassicas, the coal, the kale, the mustards should not be mycorrhizal. It is detrimental as far as anybody can tell, it's detrimental to have those colonized by the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So you kind of when you're when you have crops that you're growing, you want to separate those areas where you have the brassicas um, because they don't do well if there's a lot of mycorrhizal colonization. And then you want the all of the you know the onions and the garlic and the uh, shallots and your tomatoes and potatoes and herbs and spices and um, and then into the shrubs, the vines, the deciduous trees. Those all require the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And then the conifers are the things that require the ectomycorrhizal fungi. And you really want to keep those beds the same thing year after year after year after year. You don't have to rotate crops if you have the biology um, working because the biology is what should be taking care of the diseases and pests and the problem organisms. So yep, I've, um, I've had um, Perry Gillum on, on the show. She wrote a book on the Monsanto papers. And uh, like I said, Marie Rodell has also been on the podcast, but she also wrote a contribution for the book that there's also discussion on some of these industrial farms where they use seeds and chemicals, heavy chemical industrial, that there's almost a, and I'm sorry to, to be rude or to, to hurt anyone's feelings, but it's a form of raping almost when the, the winds blow and those seeds blow over into other people's farms, that it actually is ruining, you know, a good organic farm or others because because of that mixture of, of, of things that don't really function and work well together. 
And what you were just talking about was just not only those um, those fungal kingdoms, you know, the different the different versions as well, but on on the mycorrhiza, the, you know, spinach and broccoli don't use mycorrhiza. That's you know, so that's not something that's important. But there are so many ty different types, enormous different types of mycorrhiza that are the the really a big help and source for our plants for 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 all different kinds that are needed to have that healthy fungal um, growth in, in our in in our soils and in our farming practices. The way I first learned about mycorrhiza and uh, and uh, this is a question for you uh, um, that I've had for a lot of years is the way I first learned about it was from Lynn Margulis. And I don't know how, how much you know about her, but I love, I've got microcosmos, symbiotic earth, what is life? And all, I mean, I'm a big, huge fan of Lynn Margulis and her symbiotic earth documentary. And I'm so sad that she left us soon, but she disrupted the scientific community, which I think you have done as well with your work. And, and I, I love to see it because that is that female empowerment and that, true knowledge that we need but this whole symbiosis and Gaia with James Lovelock and symbiotic relationships that you talk and practice and preach in your soil health every day what influence did she have if any what did you learn about her in this four decades 46 years now you've been doing this did any of that kind of jive or come together that you say oh our microbiome and we have symbionts in us and it's related to mycorrhiza and that was that an aha moment or was it some different way that you came to this entire process oh gosh yeah um it lynn margle is the, the first time i um learned about her and i started reading the books um i was just overwhelmed because this made so much more sense to me that things worked in community and it wasn't a dog eat dog world it's you know it's kind of you know the the paternal sort of view of the world dog eat dog and the and the best one rises to the top because they have i don't know they bite harder than anybody well, else the misunderstanding of darwin you know survival of the fittest natural selection and everything that you talk about it is it just told us now but in all your writings and your work it's that everything works in cooperation and harmony and and the symbiosis the symbionts not only in our body but in our soils that we need each other in this cooperative collaborative manner and it's not survival of the fittest only the strong survive severe competition i think that's a big misunderstanding and that's what you know i i love about yeah, what i hear exactly. from exactly and it's just uh, i feel like i've <clears throat> grown because of her she was a stepping stone to for me to be able to go okay i'm going to explain all of this on this whole different basis and it makes so much more sense all of these creatures are working with each other. Maybe if some alien invader comes along, yeah, some horrible disease blows in from, uh, you know, Thailand or something. Um, okay, now we've got to, you know, we've got to rally the forces and we've got to get rid of this problem organism. But a lot of it is its conditions too. So um, it, there's so many more examples of collaboration and working with and joining forces to get rid of one problem um, that that's the normal way, you know, and, and here we are as human beings still stuck in, you know, what, it, you know, Creozoic or something era uh, that uh, when are we going to step out into the light, please, let's get going on working together instead of fighting with each other and trying to have to prove who's the best who's the top who's winning the nobel peace prize this year i don't care um what have they done to better the you know um the plight of human beings so yeah we all science is done by standing on the shoulders of the people who came before you to do this work and other people, other students of mine will stand on my shoulders and they'll continue on. 
there's so much left to learn. We've barely scratched the surface. And it's like five, if you had talked to me five years ago, we would only have had five overarching principles. In the last five years, we'd have added two more. So um, the weed situation where the guys in um, University of Tokyo in Japan have been showing, they have a whole herd of papers where they've been putting that information out. Um, and uh, uh, then the um, carbon uh, sequestration, when you are really trying to sequester carbon in the soil, you have to get the fungi growing because that's what's putting the most carbon back into the soil. And it just horrifies me when people talk about the soil doesn't do anything to sequester. No, that's where the carbon dioxide came from. We've got to put that carbon dioxide back in to the place that it came from. Now, how are you going to do that? You're going to grow fungi because um, David Johnson, for example, at New Mexico State University has been showing that is as fungi increase, so does the amount of carbon sequestered. And it's, it's incredible. You go from, you know, like 0.5 um, tons of carbon equivalents per 12 inch depth of soil per year. That's the low spot where you have almost no fungi left in your soil. Now you start getting some decent levels of fungi and now you're looking at 11 tons sequestered every year. Uh, my units are not always exactly right on too many, too many milligrams. is fine. Yeah, great. I'm approximating. So if you get it a little bit later in, in succession where you get even more fungal dominance in that, that soil, you may be able to sequester 43 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents in the top 12 inches of the soil in a year. Well, now most of the time the soil is going to go deeper than 12 inches. So now how about how much carbon can be sequestered in two feet? Well, double 43. What if you're, you, you've got three feet of soil or what if you've got 10 feet of soil? Well, now we're sequestering 430 tons. How deep does your soil go? If you go to um, people who drill down into the surface of the planet, soils exist to the farthest extent that you can go, where the innards of the earth are starting to get to be so hot that they're liquid. So 16 miles? of or 12 miles you know the the this geologists bandy those things about and i'm not it's not my science so uh i just listen to them and go uh-huh okay 12 miles is that it will all agree 12 miles no um okay how about 10 no not yes be a scientists big like to root. argue that well the roots don't go all the way down <laughs> But there are organisms, there are active living bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes down at that depth. And so if they can be sequestering carbon even that deep, well, you know, okay, do we need to look at the rates? But if you've got root systems like a Douglas fir easily can put its root systems down 250 feet. So we are way off in terms of understanding where we should be putting that carbon. And it should be put back into the soil because that's where it came from. The Great Plains of the United States, when you read journals of the pioneers and they describe that soil, rich, dark, chocolate colored soil. And so we're looking at something that is probably at least 50% organic matter, if not more like 75 or 85% organic matter. And today, when you go back to those same places, less than 1.1% organic matter. So where did all that elevated CO2 in the atmosphere come from? Yeah, the US, turn around and take a look at yourself because that can explain most of the elevated carbon in the atmosphere. Well, Canadians can have a little bit of, of that fing finger shaking going on, but really the point is to get the biology working for you start building that carbon sequest that carbon sequestration of that carbon 
as rapidly as possible. If everybody started making compost from their waste materials and they followed the directions of making really good compost that they can then put on their um, soils, put on their beds and grow the food from that old waste, happily much um, different si sizes and shapes and uh, toxicity. Um, it would only take something like six to 10 years to take all of that elevated CO2 in the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. Amazing. There is, I mean, we, we could real literally talk for days. Uh, um, I, I only have three more questions for you because we, we don't have days. You're so busy with your schedule. Uh, I, I would love to, I think we might need to have a part two or part three uh, eventually because it, it is so amazing. Um, I have a stack of books that I, I set right here that you've contributed to or you've been part of the people who've been in your summit or in your courses. Um, you, you, you mentioned Wendell Berry, you also, you know, Unsettling of America and some of the great things that, you know, he says the soil is the great connector of lives, the source and destination of all it is the healer the restorer the resurrector by which disease passes into health age into youth death into life without proper care for it we can have no community because without proper care for it we have no life and that's everything that you talk about and i just love the way you teach your courses the way you write the way you tell us about so not only do i feel your passion but you are reconnecting me with our soil, with our earth. And I know that we're very, this biome that I'm carrying around is very similar to that biome. And if my biome and my microcosmos, my soil around me is healthy, that most likely I'm gonna be healthy and the food I'm gonna eat is healthy and, and the, way it, the way I eat is gonna be healthy. Um, there, there, there are two things that I still wanted to talk about. One is, how important it is um, to kind of transition to this no tillage. I really think that's a big help in, in restoring and healing our soils in, in a lot of respect, kind of, and that the, the harvest and the things that we're seeing on no tillage are, are keeping up to speed with, with tillage, with those who are tilling the ground and using other harvesting methods just as well. Uh, and it's also doing a lot of benefits so i'd like to touch on that if you don't mind a little bit just kind of what your recommendations and why why we're moving more and more in that direction um mostly because when you till you slice and dice and crush and destroy at least 50 percent of those organisms that are in that soil um, we wipe out species when in that soil, in that place at least, we wipe out species when we till. And we really have to stop disturbing things so often. You know, back in the days before we had motorized anything, um, you used to get behind your, your donkey and uh, you know, you'd hitch, hick them, hitch them up to the um, the, the tillage equipment, you had one blade and you walked behind pushing that blade down into the ground, trying to keep it even, try to keep the animal walking in a straight line so your, your rows would be straight. Um, and it was just, it was a lot of work, very hard work in, in order to do that. And, you know, so as all of those soils got trashed, if you will, um, elevated salt, um, is uh, often the problem that the, their waters all get um, elevated um, salts in them and the civilization would have to move on. They'd have to go elsewhere. Well, when we uh, invented the uh, motorized um, tillage back in the late 1800s, um, we started destroying that soil every, um, every time you were gonna plant your seeds. Well, today, if you go out to an agricultural, large agricultural farm, you will notice that they're out there tilling 
their soil in order to get something mixed into the soil once a week. So we are tilling and destroying any beneficial organisms in that soil once a week. How could we possibly expect that to recover? And so what is it that's left in that soil? The diseases and the pests, because they do just fine at avoiding the, um, the tillage equipment. So we've really let ourselves down this pathway to hell, if you will. Um, not, not very well planned. We didn't pay any attention to the organisms at all. Um, I remember when I started graduate school at Colorado State University, one of the big agricultural universities in the United States. And um, my major professor, Dr. Donald Klein, and I got together and decided that I would do a PhD work on um, fungi, specifically how do we determine whether fungi are active or not when they're in soil. And it's, it's simple to do that. It just takes a stain. Um, but I really wanted to find out what fungi do for plants, if anything. And so my major professor had me go around to all of the people in the uh, school that worked with soil. So horticulturalists, landscape people, uh, the ag department, the soil science department, all of those places. And I went in and talked to the professors and to a man. They looked at me like I was crazy as I was discussing what I wanted to do for my PhD. And their first remark to me was invariably, you can't possibly expect that you're going to get a job after you finish that degree. And then I, well, well, why not? Because bacteria and fungi don't do anything in the soil. They're just there. They don't do anything. They're, they don't affect your plant in any way, shape, or form. And I, my God, are these people, these are the world uh, acclaimed people in soil science or horticulture or whatever. And they're telling me that these microorganisms that have survived, that have lived for 4 billion years in the soil for three and a half billion years, if you're a fungus, that they do nothing. Why would mother nature keep them around? Why would they still be here? You know, when, when dinosaurs got to be too much, she just whoop, gone, 50,000 years, gone. Um, but she's never done that with bacteria and fungi. I think they're doing something. Give me the chance to figure that one out. And that's basically what I've been doing with the rest of my career is figuring out what these organisms do to help plants grow. And it's a very communal, they work together. There are ways to deal with any part of that group that starts getting out of control because everything's got a predator. You know, so I remember with one person, it was like the bacteria and fungi, the bacteria were getting so high. What are we supposed to do? We're going to have to go in there and autoclave the soil. And it's like, no, what do you think predators of the bacteria would do? To the bacteria. Well, okay, they would start eating the bacteria. And we are, are they going to eat just a few bacteria? Or are they going to multiply? Are the are the predators going to multiply? And now instead of one predator, you've got 10 predators or a hundred or a thousand. Oh yeah. So after a while, the bacterial population is going to drop back down to what it's supposed to be. Bingo, you got it. And what if the conditions are a little bit different and they're not supporting the protozoa? Now what do we do? We better have another predator, another bacterial feeding nematode that will get out there and eat those bacteria. <coughs> well, how about earthworms? Do they eat bacteria? Oh, yeah. How about incotreids? Do they eat bacteria? Oh, yeah. There are multiple predators for every group in the food web, which is why we call it a food web. Because there's no, it's not a straight chain. That, that was a pretty ridiculous way to view uh, linkages between, you know, the plants are eaten by herbivores, are eaten by carnivores, and that's the food chain. 
No, it does not work like that. So in the below ground, there's arrows going every which way, but eventually you get to us who are the, at least we'd like to believe we're the top of the food web, which means we're, so, we're responsible for everything else on this that goes into making food for us. It's and how, amazing because you, you, you're talking about this, you're talking about kind of, you know, how can, it seems like there's so much of an expert in those scientists and, and men who, who you had these discussions with that they were so specialized in their areas, they weren't seeing the world in a symbiotic way, but they were seeing not in a systemic way either. It's very siloed and, and, and they didn't see all these multiple facets. And there's another, there's a slide that I use in my presentations once in a while. And, I, I, and this touches right towards that. And that's why I want to bring it up. It's in 2015, we discovered on the bacteria tree of life, this whole new section um, you know, the can candidate and phyla uh, radiation and uh, park the bacteria. I can't even say some of the names, you know, the eucalyptus and, and stuff that we didn't even know existed until 2015 or hadn't really been discovered or talked about too much. And then we're realizing most of those live within our body as well, or, or in, you know, the geysers of Yellowstone or, or whatever. So it's unbelievable. Well, it's, how It's interesting you know, for me to, for you to be bringing up all of these things, because, uh, you know, like with um, uh, the first, the, oh gosh, I love it when I can't remember names. Uh, the woman who did, uh, we were talking about her books. Lynn, Mar Lynn Margulis. Lynn Margulis. Gosh, how could I forget? Um, she faced that same, Lynn Margulis faced something very similar um that the work that she did was just not believed that would that we know is just thrown aside you're crazy woman you don't know what you're talking about now here we are again bringing up another example of where somebody went flying in the face of what was believed to be the truth and we've got it all worked out no one ever has to learn anything more about this because we got it all figured out and then the chinks start breaking apart. Same with me. When I first finished, when I finished my PhD work and wrote up my um, uh, papers for the scientific community, there was a lot of, you know, uh, throwback at me that, you know, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. I still run into that with uh, certainly the oldest generation. I do have to say the load's gotten lighter in the last 10 years because most of the people my age or older are retired and they go away as a problem as a you know you're not going to get over this wall because it's built too high and i'd want to retire too if i had such a boring narrow-minded siloed approach or specific area uh, well you've discovered everything everything's fine but you're just, as you said, you're tickling the surface. This is the, the prime time. Why, why retire? Why give up uh, this beautiful thing? Because that's what, that's how life really is. It's it just it, it continues on, and I love that. Yeah, this discovery opens up the light on the whole next set of discoveries, and it's way more than one person can do. So. Now, I keep welcoming more students and new students. Come on in, help us. We need your help. You know, there's a project, there's a project, there's a project. Which one do you want to do? And their research is going to open up more places that we've got to know more about, especially if we want to be feeding everybody on this planet. So people always, you know, talk about, well, you know, there's only so much carbon. Well, there's only so much carbon in that pool. But if we change these other pools, this can fluctuate. This is going to fluctuate. This is going to fluctuate. That is, you know, and we got to figure out how you time everything. So there's no backup here. So there's no way too fast going through here. If we get it figured out, we could. How many people could we have on this planet? Well, you know, there is a obvious physical 
you know, we can't go any further than uh, a certain level, but you'd think that we would be able to colonize Mars by that time. <laughs> I, I live in Hamburg, Germany right now, but I'm from America and, um, but I've been to China and Philippines and many other places. Uh, in Europe and especially in Asia, people are living on top of each other. You'd be surprised how many people we can fit into a rather small space. But having family in the U.S., I know how it is to, to live, you know, to drive. You have to drive to the mailbox. Some people would drive to the TV to change the channel, you know, if, if they could. <laughs> so to say, I, I tease it's over exaggerated, but there are some wide open spaces and and. It's amazing what we can do because the uh, and, and what can be achieved, but I do think we have room for a lot more uh, from from the studies and history. I actually think we're going to be going into a decline. I think it's going to level out and if we can figure out the food uh, soil food web and and figure out how to fix some of these these problems, the the better people, um, are educated, the better they do, the basic rights are covered and they have this, then there's going to be um, better quality of life. And so I think there's going to be a nice balancing out and equality uh, around the world. It's just so we can put more some of my personal thoughts and what I've seen out there and read and what the, yeah. where I see we're going. See, and, and everybody could work on these really interesting questions that we need to have answered. There's that's where we need to put our time and effort not to you know chase down criminals or you know have people so depressed and um not you know homeless and all of those kinds of questions yeah. i agree we got the last uh, hardest question i have for you is one i ask all my guests and um it, it i can ask it in two ways one is really what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Elaine? Oh, man, we could have some of the greatest gardens in the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all I just go right back to the soil, you know, and the plants and the foods, and everything you eat should have all of these beneficial organisms on them in whatever part of the country you're in, so that you're capable of decomposing in your digestive system, that food, um, that you need to have, but we don't have the enzymes in our own bodies to break those things down. We have to rely on these microorganisms that are on the surfaces of everything. So you know, when you eat a blueberry, you want it covered with these really beneficial organisms. When you snack down on a banana, right now you have to worry about how many toxic chemicals were sprayed on the outside of the banana. So how am I going to open up my banana without getting my fingers covered with all these horrible toxic chemicals in order to eat the inside without touching the inside because that's all covered with bad, you know, it's just insanity what we're doing. So, yep, I think we could all work together and have an absolutely wonderful time making sure that this planet becomes the Garden of Eden. Thank you so much. That's so wonderful. Elaine, Dr. Elaine R. Ingham, it was so wonderful that you let us inside of your ideas and we could talk for hours and hours, but you have given us uh, a glimpse into your passion and to your studies and life's work. And I want to attend all your courses because uh, I know I, I really do. And I, I really hope that you'll uh, consider a, a contribution in Menu B. Uh, it's been a sheer pleasure. I tell everybody I know about you and, and I really thank you for the time. And, and that's all I have for you. I just appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, I thank you so much for inviting me to come talk. And if you've got any good suggestions for next year's Soil Summit, please let me know and I hope you come and attend as well. Um, certainly if you had some ideas for some topics that we need to cover that we haven't covered before, really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure you could probably put together a pretty interesting talk at the Soil Summit. So I would, I would love that. Consider and, and, yourself. And I have some ideas already. So thank you very much. Please, yes, that would be great. I, I would love that. And, and um, 
Well, thank you, Mark, and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. I will, and you as well, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.